turn. This is drbell.com. The Rachel Maddow Show, weeknights at 9 Eastern on MSNBC. Thanks for joining us tonight. Really happy branding themselves as the alt-right because Donald Trump got elected president. They didn't also come into existence because Donald Trump was elected president. The Heil Hitler, let's make a white homeland corner of American white extremism, it didn't suddenly spring out of the toilet it usually lives in because this guy got elected. The, the white supremacist nightmare edge of American politics, they started rebranding themselves as the alt-right years ago. And I hereby re-up for discussion the fact that well before this president moved on from reality TV, it was the Republican Party in Congress before Trump that started to insinuate these guys into otherwise mainstream Republican politics. Don't believe me? Watch this. This is what we did at the time. But we have to start tonight in Montana at the headquarters of an organization that likes to think of itself as America's think tank for the white nationalist movement. They don't like to say white supremacist, apparently. They like to say white nationalist. They think it sounds better. You can judge for yourself. Who stands for us? Have you ever wondered, why isn't there an organization that works for us? From African Americans to illegal immigrants, from lesbians to left-handers, every ethnic and interest group has its own lobby or cultural foundation. The exception, of course, is white Americans. This is the white supremacist, think, uh, sorry, the white nationalist uh, think tank group. They call themselves the National Policy Institute. Their slogan, you can see at the top there, for our people, our culture, our future. And when they say our, they are being really, really specific about who they mean. As long as whites continue to avoid and deny their own racial identity, at a time when almost every other racial and ethnic category is rediscovering and asserting its own, whites will have no chance to resist their dispossession. This is our challenge. This is our calling. Won't you join us? So if you poke around on the website of the white supremacist, uh, white nationalist uh, think tank, yeah, you can kind of see how they're trying to update the whole racist image. So, yeah, some of them are still kind of skinhead-looking guys, but they wear suits, you know, and some of them have hair. Uh, but it's, this is an old-school kind of thing. This is, you know, no interbreeding, protect the sanctity of whiteness from the inferior races. It is exactly what you think it is with somewhat improved haircuts. If, if you dig into the fine print uh, in their online web, web presence, you'll find that they're not just an online group. They do hold physical conferences and events and things. They also maintain a P.O. box in Whitefish, Montana. And it turns out that that is the exact same address, the exact same P.O. box uh, for this online racist forum. And I saw a bunch of links to this today. We're all the way back machine. I thought maybe it was down, but no, it's all still there. Uh, it is called the Alternative Right uh, and it's an online racist forum. It describes itself as being founded by the uh, won't you join us white power guy who you just saw in the think tank video. This, for example, is their post on Holocaust Remembrance Day this, this year, this, this past January. They call it Holocaust Amnesia Day. And under a picture of a pile of dead bodies from the Holocaust, it says, I can't believe that it's crept up on me again. Today, I discover that today is Holocaust Memorial Day and I'm fresh out of onions. The author goes on to describe his decidedly mixed feelings about commemorating a supposed historical event. And then he goes on to magnanimously propose that we leave aside for the moment the question of whether this whole Holocaust thing actually happened. So, so, so this is the real deal, right? This is alternative right, which lives in the same Whitefish Montana P.O. box as the white supremacist think tank. This resinous, filthy, dank, racist little corner of the Internet uh, is relevant and is at the top of the news today because it is suddenly front and center in super mainstream American politics. This Aryan nation's supremacy of the races crock is directly linked to the legislation that finally started getting its big markup in the United States Senate today after months of buildup. Starting immediately after the presidential election, there was all this talk that the Republican Party was finally going to go along. Or we were, they were finally going to help see into law 
reform of our nation's royally screwed up immigration system. The writing was on the wall, right? After losing the presidency again and losing seats in the House and losing seats in the Senate, the writing was on the wall. The Republican Party had to get right with Latinos, at least with Latino voters. And the way it was going to do it was by supporting immigration reform finally. And even though the Beltway narrative is supposedly that Republicans see the light and Republicans support this now, it is really not clear that enough Republicans do support it that it's going to pass. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III of Alabama introduced 49 separate amendments to the bill today. And that is not because he's trying to help it along. And the most powerful conservative think tank in the country is really, really against it. The Heritage Foundation is leading the conservative opposition to anything getting done to fix the immigration system. And this is where the white supremacist problem comes in. So yesterday, it was Dylan Matthews at the Washington Post who looked up the credentials of the people who wrote the anti-immigration reform study for Heritage. And they found that one of the co-authors for the big Heritage study on this issue did his doctoral dissertation on American immigration policy, and specifically on the question of how we should shape our immigration policy to account for the fact that Latinos are so dumb as a race. I'm only barely paraphrasing. The dissertation describes Latino immigrants as generally having an IQ that is, quote, substantially lower than that of the white native population. Quote, immigrants living in the U.S. today do not have the same level of cognitive ability as natives. Quote, no one knows whether Hispanics will ever reach IQ parity with whites, but the prediction that new Hispanic immigrants will have low IQ children and grandchildren is difficult to argue against. So not only are Latinos intellectually inferior to whites, but of course they breed. Ugh. It's disgusting, right? To be clear, uh, this guy with the thesis that white people are just naturally smarter, uh, he isn't some temp that the Heritage Foundation just bumped into and it turns out he has this embarrassing past. He has a titled position at the Heritage Foundation. He's a senior policy analyst for the Heritage Foundation. And even as they try to disavow his dissertation, as if that, oh, that's in his student past, that's the one little problem with him. Today we learned, thanks to some digging by Chris Moody at Yahoo News, uh, that this guy's whole record of public output is this same kind of stuff. I mean, here's another bylined article from him. This one's from March 2010. Model minority? Question mark? It's kind of a rhetorical question. You get the implication, right? Quote, Hispanics are in fact substantially more likely than whites to commit serious crimes. These findings are not due to age differences or immigration violations or other statistical artifacts. The reality of Hispanic, of Hispanic crime should be one of the many factors we consider when setting immigration policy. That's not from some dissertation that somebody had to dig out of the Harvard library. That's on the online machine. Specifically, that's on the online machine at alternativeright.com, the place where they are cutting up onions to make themselves fake cry over the fake Holocaust, where Republicans are becoming the party of misspelled burritos, where the Whitefish Montana post office box lives with this guy, and where the Heritage Foundation's author of its immigration study is expounding on the inherent criminality of these brown people who we really ought to consider keeping out of this country. And when the Heritage Foundation, when the nation's leading conservative think tank was considering hiring him, his most recent public output, the thing he was doing online the month before Heritage hired him, was writing about the racial inferiority and criminality of Latinos as a group. And this is the world where the Heritage Foundation went to, to find an author for their study of immigration reform. And wouldn't you know it, it turns out their study concludes that it is a terrible idea to reform immigration because these immigrants, and you know who we mean, these immigrants and their children, and inevitably their grandchildren, everybody in their bloodline, they are low-achieving parasites who will feed on the native-born population, and that will be very expensive. It's not at all fiscally responsible. And we learned all of this today about the character of the opposition to immigration reform in this country. We learned about who is leading the Republican charge against immigration reform on the day that immigration reform finally gets introduced in the Senate. That was our coverage back in May 2013 of the longstanding white supremacist movement in this country rebranding itself as the alt-right and the Republican Party's willingness to dance with them for political purposes even then. President Trump's kind remarks about the white supremacists among us may be making elected Republicans now proclaim their discomfort. But there is a recent past for Republicans to reckon with on this. A recent past of Republicans and conservative groups like the Heritage Foundation really opening the door to those groups 
before Donald Trump was even known to be a Republican, let alone a Republican politician. I should also tell you um, that report, that Hispanics are parasites report, and therefore we shouldn't let them into the country, that report is still tonight proudly displayed on the website of the Heritage Foundation. It's still there. We'll be right back. Before Americans who were shell-shocked by the election uh, had started watching TV news again, um, this was quite soon after the election, a lot of people were still really in shock. Um, this was actually so, so soon after the election that really even the presidential transition hadn't really even gotten up and running. So before Thanksgiving, um, after the election this past year, there was a show of force in Washington, D.C., that when you look back at it now, it rings like a bell in terms of what it foreshadowed for this new presidency. To be white is to be a striver, a crusader, an explorer, and a conqueror. We build, we produce, we go upward. And we recognize the central lie of American race relations. We don't exploit other groups. We... We don't gain anything from their presence. They need us and not the other way around. Two weeks ago, I might have said the election of Donald Trump would actually lessen the pressure on white Americans. But today it is clear his election is only intensifying the storm of hatred and hysteria being directed against us. As Europeans, we are uniquely at the center of history. We are, as Hegel recognized, the embodiment of world history itself. No one will honor us for losing gracefully. No one mourns the great crimes committed against us. For us, it is conquer or die. This is a... <clears throat> This is a unique burden for the white man, that our fate is entirely in our hands. And it is appropriate because within us, within the very blood in our veins as children of the sun, lies the potential for greatness. That is the great struggle we are called to. We were meant to overcome, overcome all of it, because that is natural and normal for us. Because for us, as Europeans, it is only normal again when we are great again. See what he did there? When we are great again, we European make white people great again. Also, did you notice that white people are children of the sun? Did you notice that line from him? I mean, if, I would just, I'm no expert, but I would think that children of the sun would be more tan. You know what I'm saying? This was not a tan group. India, a country of extremes like no other, of a staggering diversity, where ethnicity, culture, religion and language come together in a dazzling kaleidoscope of humanity. In its 7,000 year old history, India has provided the world with its riches. However, India's invaluable contributions to science and technology have all too often been overlooked. They've become so much a part of our daily life that we've taken them for granted. India's ancient knowledge remains an untold story. Few know how profoundly India has shaped the modern world. That it was India that came up with the concept that fueled the global high-tech revolution. That it was India that helped nurture the roots of modern medicine. As it turns out, the key to scientific and technological innovations of the present, and it may be of the future, have long lain hidden in the untold story of what the ancient Indians knew. Colourful impressions in the ancient city of Delhi are almost overwhelming for someone coming from the West. Exotic and totally foreign, 
They reflect a culture that has one foot in the past and the other solidly planted in the future. With poverty on one side, India has one of the fastest growing economies on the other. India is poised to lead the world into the future. Just why is an important part of the untold story of India's scientific and technological contributions. Contributions that have been decisive in shaping the present. To look at one of the most astounding feats of India's past, I travelled to Jaipur, some 300 miles south of Delhi. Jaipur is famous for its legendary pink palace, but I was looking for a scientific treasure of magnificent scale. Here in Jaipur, the Hindu belief spurred an innovation of unprecedented precision. Much like in the modern Western world, the movements of the sun, the planets and the stars were believed to affect human life. In order to determine the most auspicious times for important events, like festivals or marriages, precision was crucial. Astrology, a pseudoscience claiming divination by the positions of the planets, the sun and the moon, gave rise to one of India's oldest and most important sciences, astronomy. I'd heard and read about the Janta Manta, but nothing quite prepared me for this unique site. The Janta Manta is one of five observatories built by Maharaja Jai Singh more than 300 years ago. What looks like a giant playground is in fact an architectural and astronomical marvel. Unlike the small metal tools the Europeans developed to read the stars, some of the 16 astronomical instruments built here out of stone, mortar and plaster are the biggest in the world. Prior to Jai Singh's time, astronomers relied on smaller instruments such as the astrolabe. The immense forms that Jai Singh built here and elsewhere in India are the only ones of their kind. Why is it that an instrument like this is so big? Resident astronomer Dr. S. Bhattacharya explained the importance of scale. circumference and the large number of markings you can have on the circumference and really small angles you can measure through. And is that true of all of the instruments? They're all so big because that makes them all more accurate? Yes, exactly. The measurements can be really accurate. So the bigger it is, the greater the precision? Yes, exactly. The larger there is a the circumference, then the smaller angular measures you can mark on these dials. Mm -hmm. At Janta Manta, the ancients could track the movement and position of the celestial bodies with a higher level of accuracy than anyone before them. Believe it or not, the object behind me is a sundial. It's not one of those cute little circular ones you see. It is in fact the largest sundial in the world. This equinoctial sundial is called Samrat Yantra, which translates to supreme instrument. It is just under 75 feet high and Jai Singh's most important creation. And these steps run 164 feet along the gnomon, the structure that creates the angle of the sundial. Jai Singh oriented the structure to the north. On an east-west line, he positioned the axis of a hemisphere to create two quadrants. Using geometry, he calculated the angle of the ramp at 27 degrees, equivalent to the latitude of Jaipur. So the ramp points exactly to the celestial north pole. The shadow from the ramp falls onto the quadrant showing the local time, accurate to within seconds. So can you tell me how accurate is this sundial? Well, that's it. Dr. S. Bhattacharya, the assistant director of the nearby Birla Planetarium, explained Samrat Yantra's accuracy. Well, it measures, smallest measure of time is two seconds. Each of these is two seconds? The smallest ones are two seconds. But there are problems, of course, because sun is not a point pinpoint source. The difference between the shadow and the light is not obvious. Okay. Your error can be more than two seconds. But still, that's pretty, pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. Every hour this ancient Indian innovation was used around the world for hundreds of years. Jai Singh's Samrat Yantra was astonishing in that equinoxes and solstices could be determined down to the second. Both of these celestial events 
are rather important to astronomical or astrological systems around the world. But he didn't create something out of nothing. Jai Singh's designs capitalized on a dimension of science and technology with much older roots in India's history, mathematics. It all started with a dream. According to Hindu tradition, the world began from nothing when it was dreamed by Brahma, the creator god of India. Brahma's waking and sleeping pattern was believed to govern vast cycles of history. So vast indeed, that a single Brahma day lasted one kalpa, that is 4.32 billion years. Almost the same time span modern geologists estimate to be the age of planet Earth. Ancient Hindu chants and writings contain calculations of these Brahma cycles, outlining Indian mathematical works back to the 4th century BC. Interestingly, the ancients used words to express numbers. The word arms was used as the number two, since humans have two arms. But words didn't lend themselves for calculations, so around 10 BC, they were replaced by symbols. Prior to the Indians, the Babylonians had two symbols. This symbol signified 1, 60, and 3,600, and this symbol signified 10. Obviously, with only two symbols, the applications were limited. To write six, it took six symbols. Even in the Roman system, it took two symbols. In the Indian system, however, it took only one symbol. For more convenience and accuracy, the ancient Hindu language, Sanskrit, replaced word numbers with nine single digits. It is the Indian system of nine digits that we use today. Traders and merchants were looking for an easy way to count and calculate. So commerce became the motor for ancient Indian mathematics and a numeric system that invented this crucial digit. It's the last symbol of this ingenious system for which we remain forever indebted to the ancient Indian thinkers. Zero. For them, the symbol stood for the Sanskrit word shunya, meaning nothing. But once the concept became a symbol, mathematical computation was born. Just like Brahma's dream, from nothing came everything. The impact of India's long history with the zero can be felt across our high-tech world. No zero, no binary system, no computers. Without the concept of zero, modern mathematicians and physicists would all be out of a job. All of this, the computers, the software, would be impossible without the preeminent ancient Indian invention, one that's been called the equal of any single human achievement, right up there with mastering fire or the invention of the wheel, the invention of the concept of zero. Numbers have become so much a part of our daily lives that we forget where they came from. And if you ask most people about the origin of our numbers, they'll probably say they were Arabic, and that would be wrong. It's not difficult to see how this mistake occurred. Arab traders introduced the 10-digit system to the West around 900 AD. But even in their own records, Arab scholars refer to the Indian system. In all likelihood, the Arabs picked up the Indian way of counting in a marketplace much like this one. It was a time when knowledge was bartered and traded like a commodity when merchants from China or Arabia travelled to India for treasures found nowhere else, like spices, gems, and a special metal with far-reaching impact. In search of the first advanced material in the ancient world, I travelled north to the foot of the Himalaya mountains to find clues to the legendary wood steel. From the dawn of their civilization, 
the Indians wisely utilized what the land provided, devising methods to shape nature to meet their needs. India's history of metalworking is documented in some of the oldest written records in the world. It is legendary. Yet only a few tantalizing clues to the source of that legend remain. Here, along the road to the Himalayas, I'd heard there were groups of itinerant workers who still retained one of the main skills of the ancient Indian metal craft. The Gadulia Alohas are blacksmiths whose smelting traditions reach back more than 3,000 years. Watching them hand forge simple tools carried me back in time. I could easily imagine how the ancients smelted and forged their iron. Their methods seem to have changed very little. Iron ore from deposits across India was placed in a mud and brick furnace charged with charcoal. Bellows provided an air supply that brought the temperature up to 1100 degrees Celsius. The molten iron or bloom collected and cooled at the bottom. In order to make a tool or a weapon, the ancients reheated and hammered the bloom into shape, much like these lohas do with bars of scrap iron. After a few whacks with the hammer, I came to appreciate the blacksmith's skills. And what's more, I realized that while the ancestors of these lohars forged everyday tools that contributed to India's wealth, it wasn't sickles but swords that brought the world to India's shores. When in the 11th century AD, European crusaders felt the effect of Islamic swords in battle, their war stories launched the legend of the Damascus blade. One blow from the sword they said could cleave a European helmet without turning its edge, or slice just as easily through a floating silk scarf. Though the swords were forged in Damascus, the capital of modern Syria, the steel and the technology came from India. Europeans took thousands of these fabled blades home, determined to uncover their secret. Yet, the formula remained a mystery for centuries. Besides smelting, I looked for another clue in my search for the fabled wood steel. To learn more, I travelled north to the foot of the Himalaya mountains. Following in the footsteps of ancient traders, for whom no distance was too far to get their hands on the fabled woods, I was in good company. Even Alexander the Great had sought this ancient Indian treasure. Today at Windless Steel Company in the town of Dehradun, they're making replicas of the Damascus blade. Now, of course, they use modern tools, but the basic approach remains the same. Forging, shaping and polishing constitute the major steps in creating a blade. Still, the big question remains, whether the modern replicas retain more than just the look of the legendary steel. One legend would have us believe that to give the sword its finishing touch, the metal was cooled by thrusting it through the body of a muscular slave to have his strength flow into the sword. And that's not the only outrageous tale. Others believe that the strength of Damascene steel came from quenching the sword in the urine of a red-headed boy or in a goat that had eaten ferns for three days, neither of which got them very far. In the centuries after the Crusades, many sought to replicate the swords of Damascus, but most achieved only the appearance not the properties. In fact, it took nearly till 1975 to unlock the secret of the Syrian sword of Indian wood steel. The irony is the most important legacy of the ancient Indian metal workers was not the recipe of the steel, but a byproduct of the search for it. 
Over the centuries, many metallurgists came to believe the blade's secret lay in its unique surface pattern called water structure. The pattern, some suggested, indicated that carbon content was the key. And while that was true, all attempts to reproduce wood steel failed. And we have some latest equipments also. In a modern lab where they develop new steel products, I met Mr. S.K. Mahajan, a sheet metal expert. OK, what, what changes with steel? He's benefiting from the search for the secret to wood steel. There are a lot of developments in the automobile sector, white goods sector. Across Europe, researchers compare different metals under a microscope. They never found the secret to the magnificent metal, but what they did find was a lot of very useful information. So one byproduct of the search for wood steel was metallurgical microscopy. Discovered in 1822, it is still used today to evaluate the strength and purity of metals. So this is what happens yeah. inside. This side, uh, I'll show you the rolling mill. To see another byproduct of the search for wood steel, I took Mr. Mahajan up on an offer to inspect a rolling mill. This is one of the largest sheet metal producers in India. For centuries, metallurgists and blacksmiths tried mixing iron with everything from zinc to lead in an effort to replicate wood steel. Along the way, they took note of various new combinations and the interesting properties they had. In 1822, an English researcher by the name of Michael Faraday added chromium. He didn't get woods, but he did get a steel alloy which we could hardly live without. Stainless steel evolved from Faraday's inspired research. What would we do without it? Using heat and pressure, the alloy steel sheets are processed to become appliances, automobiles and other everyday tools and utensils. What makes stainless steel so desirable is that it doesn't rust, a property we easily take for granted. Today, steel alloys are the backbone of modern life everywhere in the world. Owing a profound debt to the ancient Indians, we use them anywhere from airplanes to operating rooms. But besides wood steel, the ancient Indian metal workers had more tricks up their sleeves. And to see some of their most monumental achievements, I travelled to the East Indian state of Orissa. Because it was here where in the 13th century AD, King Narashin Hadeva commissioned a magnificent temple dedicated to the Hindu sun god, Surya. Sun worship is one of the oldest forms of religion, not only in India. Konark Temple is the embodiment of Surya's daily ride across the sky. His chariot has 12 wheels, one for each month of the year pulled by seven horses, one for each day of the week. Konark Temple is one of India's most astounding sights. Though much of the original structure has decayed, I could see that the remains bear witness to the accomplishments of the ancient builders. Researchers know a lot about how the temple was built because of the locals' deep attachment to it. The ancient Indian contractors kept detailed accounts of the construction on palm leaf manuscripts like this one. But some local families kept the original manuscripts, from which we have an astonishingly detailed record of the project, stretching back a thousand years. Organised with mathematical precision, the manuscripts tell of a highly technical building process which was completed in only 12 years. Stone blocks were the principal building material. Iron workers played an important role in this ancient construction technique. They were the ones to forge these interlocking clamps, designed to hold the stone blocks firmly in place. What is new in this temple is that its builders relied on the innovative powers of the ancient metal workers. Using the same basic technique of heating iron ingots and hammering them together, Blacksmiths created beams up to 20 feet long and weighing over five tons. You can see here where the individual ingots were joined together. 
In so doing, the ancient blacksmiths created the first beams used in construction, a remarkable application of a simple technology. Though there's evidence that other cultures used metal to join sections of stone, the ancient Indians were the first to incorporate long metal beams as structural components. This is an impressive piece of engineering. Hand-forged iron girders support massive stone lintels to form the supporting structure of the building. During early explorations of the site, more than 20 girders were found throughout the temple. Now, given that each of these girders weighs around 10,000 pounds, and the stone lintel probably just as much, it's truly amazing that the workers could lift such a massive weight. The mystery was solved when researchers analysed the palm leaf manuscripts. It seems the builders relied on an imaginative mechanism created by the blacksmiths and a local source of auxiliary power. Using hand-forged iron pulleys and ropes, the stone lintels were placed on wooden planks. Elephants were trained to step on these to raise the lintel pieces in the air, while a team of men pulled on the ropes to set them on the girders. Throughout the construction, elephants did the heavy work. From lifting to grading, they were not only the cranes but the bulldozers levelling the building site before the foundation was laid. Their labour has made them immortal. When you think how important elephant power was to the temple builders, statues like this one make a lot of sense. The elephants deserve to be remembered for their contribution to one of the great monuments of ancient engineering and architecture. While temples like Konark rise to the skies as monuments to the innovative power and riches of ancient India, other extraordinary structures were built in the opposite direction. Underground water buildings like this one became the legacy of the ancient Indian craftsmen. They were the lifesavers in the ancient's never-ending struggle against flood and drought. The monsoon's powerful rhythms have shaped life in India since earliest times. Today, they continue to do so. 90% of India's rain falls during a three-month downpour. The deluge saturates wetlands and swells the sacred rivers, which Hindus view as goddesses, brought to earth to help humanity. For those living in arid regions, the monsoon brings life. The need for water during the nine dry months inspired the ancient Indians to develop a unique architecture. This is one of the most spectacular examples of ancient water harvesting structures. This step pond in northern India taps into a deep reservoir where it is believed sacred rivers mix. This stunning structure allows access to groundwater year-round. Its step architecture is one of India's most ingenious inventions, showcasing the expert skills of the ancient Indian stoneworkers. This style of architecture, which is unique to India, is called a water building. This particular one, the Chanbauli step pond, is the largest of its kind. Step architecture, which could be round or rectangular, was designed to meet both practical and spiritual needs in India's driest regions. Stone blocks became steps, facilitating the long walk down to the life-saving resource. And a long descent it was. The pond is over five storeys down, and farther still when the water level drops during the dry months. With stone blocks, you could build square corners and curves and keep the layers level, regardless of the incline. Whereas temple architects used stone blocks to build upwards, creating vaults and chambers. Step wells and ponds were built in the reverse direction. But first, they had to find the water. A large tree was often the clue to the source. 
Near the tree, a rectangular well was dug to check the depth of the groundwater and confirm its purity. The well was widened into a rectangular pond, which was then lined with stone blocks. The step architecture kept the walls close together to reduce evaporation and ensure that the pond stayed cool. Allegedly, this was done with a special effect in mind. Indians have a long tradition of water cooling methods. Evidence indicates that evaporation was put to a novel purpose centuries ago. European accounts of the 19th century tell of rows of shallow pottery vessels containing water, which were covered with straw and exposed to a draught. The evaporation chilled the water and could even produce small quantities of ice. Let's see if it works. I waited only a few minutes, and while I didn't expect to see any ice, the thermometer told me it really works. It's actually dropped by a few degrees. It seems like the ancients had an innovative way of making their lives a little more comfortable. Dating back a thousand years, water buildings like these show the advancement of ancient Indian science and technology. And what's more, the water harvesting techniques that sustained them for centuries are now inspiring modern applications. One project may just become a role model for others. Laparia is a small farming village some two hours drive from Jaipur in one of the driest regions of India. In a good year, the three monsoon months bring 12 to 35 inches of rain to Laparia, and that's usually enough to provide water for the people, their livestock and their crops all year round. However, the monsoon is, well, the monsoon. In some years it brings 35 inches of rain, in other years only five. With the population of the area increasing, water shortages become a serious problem. In 1982, a water management crisis inspired a local visionary. He tackled the problem using an ancient, yet innovative approach. Laxman Singh, a member of a prominent local family, has dedicated his life to reviving traditional rainwater harvesting methods in a parched and barren land. Mr. Singh explained that before he took up this cause, most modern approaches had failed because they were foreign to the villagers. So instead, he reminded them of their ancient wisdom. The water methods used in the construction of step ponds and step wells inspired the Laparia squares. Based on an ancient technique, the starting point is a gentle slope in the landscape. A large patch of the slope is divided into rectangular units of approximately 200 by 400 feet. Each unit is enclosed by dikes along the three sides that lie towards the lower part of the gradient. They're called chaukas, meaning squares. This zigzag pattern on the land allows rainwater to enter the square and fill it up. Excess flows into the next square and then onto the next. Runoff flows into a storage pond or tank. Collected water percolates through a soil filter into the groundwater, which is pumped up through the village wells. As Mr. Singh explained the process in more detail, I realized that this low-tech, high-intelligence irrigation strategy manages a limited water supply most efficiently. In fact, Laxman Singh's approach was producing more drinking water as well as sufficient water for their pastures and farmlands. As it turned out, the ancient technology was very successful. Two figures indicate the success here. In 1982, the village's largest pond, in local parlance the flower tank, irrigated 50 acres. 
Now it irrigates 700. That's a 14-fold increase based on what the ancients knew. And what's more, the example set by Laparia can serve not only as a role model for India, but for other arid regions across the planet. Looking back in time, India's 5,000-year-old tradition with cotton has the subcontinent blooming and booming again. Nearly 200 years ago, it helped spark the Industrial Revolution. And today, this unrecognised contribution has India poised to regain its first place in the global textile market, providing the world with the fabric of our modern lifestyle. This is the Chandi Chowk Bazaar in Old Delhi. For thousands of years, traders came here to find something only India could offer. A fabric so versatile that when its virtues, soft, fine and airy, were revealed, the demand fueled an economic surge that changed the world. I'm standing in a sea of a product that made India bloom and boom. Everything in this market is made of cotton. Deep within these colourful fibres is another untold story of India's contribution to our technological past. Cotton was first domesticated 5,000 years ago in the Indus Valley, a part of ancient India that is today located in western Pakistan. Each fibrous bloom is called a bol, which contains many tiny seeds. Rich in vitamins and oil, ancient farmers fed the seeds to their livestock long before the true treasure of the plant was discovered. Called wool-bearing trees by the Greeks, cotton plants were traded across the ancient world, but few devised an efficient technology to mine their magic. Cotton seeds are extremely difficult to extract, especially when ginned by hand. But the ancient Indians had already invented a more efficient mechanical device millennia ago. The churka uses two rollers, a mechanism similar to an antique clothes wringer, which pinches the cotton balls, pulling the fibres from the seeds. Modern ginning machines borrow the principle from the ancient churka, which was the standard ginning tool for nearly 4,000 years. When in the 18th century the Europeans tried to mass produce Indian quality cotton cheaply, something unforeseen happened. European inventors stimulated the Industrial Revolution, launching the Age of Machines. And although machines were able to replicate most of the legendary Indian process, one crucial manual step was never duplicated by a machine. Long ago, Indian craftsmen pioneered a tool that gave their cloth a unique quality. The origins of the spinning wheel are somewhat obscured, yet the earliest recorded appearance was in India. For millennia, thread was spun by hand and with simple spindles. Then, around a thousand years ago, the spinning wheel was developed. It was a simple, yet enormously efficient technological leap. The wheel turns the spindle which gently twists and collects the thread. The spinning wheel was so efficient that in skillful hands the normal daily output could be doubled, and yet the legendary quality was retained. Heavy industry may never be able to replicate the softness and quality of thread the spinning wheel produces. Indian fabric made in the traditional way is treasured today, in much the same way it was revered by the ancient traders. Yet when spinning was industrialised, it changed the way we live. This mass-produced, easy-to-care-for material, which though not as soft as hand-spun fabric, could now be shared around the world. Today, cotton is the pivot point of a modern lifestyle. Without cotton, none of us would have t-shirts or wear our favourite pants. 
blue jeans. You wouldn't think it, but 40% of our clothing contains cotton. With centuries of deeply rooted experience, India is once again poised to become the world's leading supplier of this ancient material. Into the production area. Thank Please. you. Thank you. In this vast modern processing plant in Alwa, two hours drive southwest of Delhi, Prana Syntex processes 800 tonnes of cotton per day. A far cry from what a farmer could produce with a churka. Here they spin some 10 million yards of thread a day, more than all the spinning wheels in India could have produced in a year. The technology that is likely to have originated in India hundreds of years ago is now re-imported from Germany, Japan and Switzerland by way of these modern machines, with the processes becoming ever more efficient. I came to realize how much ancient knowledge contributed to the importance of the marketplace, where not only goods but ideas have been bartered, exchanged and spread around the world. For thousands of years, merchants have come to buy, sell and trade here in the bazaars of India, returning home with Indian cotton goods, new ideas, perhaps ingots of raw wood steel and of course the famed Indian spices so coveted around the world. Many of these spices have medicinal properties. In ancient times, most medicines came from plants. According to the ancient Indian physiological texts, the state of one's health can be attributed to one's eating habits. Science has shown that some plants have curative powers. Willow bark is the basic ingredient for aspirin. Spices like garlic are believed to boost the immune system and help with minor ailments. Drawing from these ancient prescriptions, herbal medicine has become big business not only in India, but worldwide. Native spices and herbs are mixed in a variety of combinations by more than 8,000 pharmacies. Global demand is difficult to calculate, but herbal products in India alone constitute a billion dollar market. Herbal medicines are distributed in more than 20,000 dispensaries nationwide. But the use of herbs and spices is only one step towards health in India's comprehensive medical philosophy. Near the sacred Ganges River at the Kripalu Bagh Ashram, I found the ancient Indian healing practices still very much alive. This ashram houses an Ayurvedic clinic that treats hundreds of patients a day. Ayurveda in Sanskrit means the science of life, which defines health as total well-being. A medical diagnosis therefore does not only focus on the immediate symptom, but on the patient's relationship with food and herbs, the weather and the seasons, and even his or her personal relationships. Ayurveda was the first system of medicine to appear in the world. And finally, after 5,000 years, this holistic approach is now embraced in the West. Yoga, which is one of the most important aspects of Ayurveda, has become very popular. I'm here to learn what I can about Indian medicine. Since it all began with yoga, yoga is where I begin. Let's see what they can teach me. I joined the class at a crucial point. They were just getting ready for a breathing lesson. Ancient yoga principles emphasize the importance of deep breathing and muscle control. Recent findings indicate that yoga boosts the cardiovascular system and relieves anxiety. It seemed to work. The yogic breathing exercise, though a bit unusual, invigorated me immediately. Well, 
it may look simple, but I've just learned that breathing, which is one of the foundations of yoga, is a complicated business. I have a lot to learn. Hepatitis B ko maine theek kiya. Isse main manta hu. Yoga master Ramdev G took the time to tell me more. As a medical technique, yoga's goals are to restore the flow of vital energy around the body, to treat a variety of illnesses. Aur isse hamare heart ke blockages se lekar ke cancer. These old school methods have recently had to withstand our Western benchmarks of science. Yogi Ramdev G thought a demonstration would best make the point. Postures and stretching appear to increase circulation to the limbs. Deep breathing induces relaxation, and with practice, you can gain control of muscles you never knew you had. While yoga has reportedly helped patients suffering from afflictions like asthma and arthritis, the long lines of people at this clinic were clearly hoping that Ayurveda could do much more. I couldn't think of a better way to learn about Ayurveda than to become a patient of an Ayurvedic doctor. So I scheduled an appointment with Dr. Gaval. Hello, can I come in? Please. I have a prescription letter. Yes, please sit down. Thank you. I would like a checkup. Okay. I'd like please. a general Ayurvedic checkup, please. From where? Australia. Okay. I tell you what's this Ayurveda. Dr. Gaval explained that in Ayurveda it is all about your humors. Good health has to do with the balance of internal forces or doshas. But to begin with, Dr. Gaval started like any Western doctor would. Chest, okay? He listened to my heart and lungs. Yes. 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 Okay. Cheek. Okay. Then he switched to Ayurveda. First of all, I see your nails. He examined the yes. color and texture of my fingernails and eyes, which could indicate a dosha imbalance. Uh, just like I have... The pulse examination was the clincher. Since 13th century Vedic texts, pulse examination is one of the oldest forms of medical diagnosis. Each of the three internal forces or doshas pulses through the radial artery. Dr. Gaval's index finger read vaya, which stands for air and ether. His middle finger picked up pitta, that is fire and water, and kapha, earth and water, registered on his ring finger. Then your nadi is completely fit now. Thank you. Okay. You are totally fit. Once he had pronounced that my doshas were in balance and that I was in good health, Dr. Gaval taught me some of Ayurveda's little-known accomplishments. It was amazing to learn that hundreds of years before European medicine, Ayurvedic doctors had already developed a remarkable range of specialties. They included psychiatry, pediatrics, ophthalmology, toxicology, gynecology, and surprisingly, surgery. As it turns out, the ancient Indians had designed surgical instruments and developed unprecedented operating techniques centuries ago. Recently, one of their ancient techniques, which was once used to repair a punishment for adultery, has become rather popular. Throughout India's history, even medicine has taken its twists and turns. Tracking the legacy of the ancient Ayurvedic surgeons led me to one of Delhi's largest hospitals. I had arranged a meeting with Dr. Lokesh Kumar, a plastic surgeon. Familiar with Indian medical history, he assured me that one ancient Indian invention in particular was making a lot of people very happy today. In ancient times, the standard punishment for adultery was removal of the nose. This gave ancient surgeons plenty of opportunities to practice rhinoplasty, or as it's more commonly known today, a nose job. Dr. Kumar, it's fair to say that Indian doctors have been doing what you do for a very long time. 
Well, this operation of rhinoplasty, it uh, evolved in India. The earliest description of that is 600 BC was the tissue taken from the cheek. Right. But the basic principle remains the same. So what you're saying is that the practice you do today is exactly the same as the ancient practice. That's right, mm. because the reconstructive rhin rhinoplasty has been practiced for ages, ages. We mark Except it for a slightly that, different measuring technique, little has the, changed in the procedure uh, invented by the ancient Indian surgeons. making the nose. A leaf was used to measure the area to be covered. A flap of skin was dissected from the cheek or the forehead and flipped over. One side remained attached to provide the blood supply. The flap was then sutured to scarified areas on the cheek. Wooden tubes were inserted to form the nostril. The essential technique of moving skin from one place to another is exactly the same as the ancient technique. Well, that's right. Why we take the tissue from the forehead is because the skin here is quite elastic. And when we have taken sufficient skin from the forehead, we can actually mobilize the skin to close the defect. So you can get a new nose and clean up the wrinkles on your forehead all at the same time. Well, that, that's right. You get the forehead wrinkles removed as a bonus. I wouldn't mind a bit of that. <laughs> What most impressed me about my visit to Dr. Kumar's was the sheer antiquity of plastic surgery. For centuries, this ancient Indian idea has been a true blessing for those who desperately needed it, and for those who are merely looking for a little improvement. As I left the clinic and looked into the faces of modern India, I could not help but think what a debt we owe to this ancient culture. From mathematics to architecture, what we wear to what we eat, our lives have been shaped by an ancient wisdom. For 7,000 years, India has provided the world with its riches. India's contributions to science and technology may be obscured by time, but there is little doubt they provided the springboard for advances which shaped our world. Given India's track record, one thing seems certain. What the ancient Indians knew is worth rediscovering.